Welcome back to the show, everybody. Check out these headlines. Ripple Central Bank pilot in Africa. We're going to get into it. Terra trading halted two times in the last 24 hours, but there may be a bailout. Hang on. We're going to get into it. And the current administration accused of weaponizing EPSOC for stablecoin and crypto regulation. We're going to want that too. I tell you, there's that and so much more. And XRP's up over 14% in the last 24 hours. Somebody rolled a beautiful intro. Digital Perspectives with Brad Kimes. Come on in. Welcome back to the show, everybody. You can follow me on Twitter at Dig Perspectives and everything we're or talking about here. Make sure you give us a follow there. Facebook at Digital Perspectives News No Spaces and Digital Perspectives No Spaces on TikTok. It's growing like fire over there. I'm telling you. $1.36 trillion market cap. Not a lot of money when we had three plus trillion for their all-time high of crypto, but we're up eight and a half percent, ladies and gentlemen. Look at this. 30,000 plus for Bitcoin, 2,000 plus now for Ethereum, XRP, 44 cents. We're up over 14% on the 24 hour. Whoa, have we seen a turnaround? 37 cents on the bottom, 47 on the top. We are moving in the right direction, ladies and gentlemen. And speaking of the right direction, take a look at this. This is Steve and Joni Gould Bronson with Nick Burefado from Link2.com right here. They had a meetup down in Orlando, and they all got together. What an incredible picture. Whoever took that picture, it's so in focus, it could be an NFT. It's just remarkable. And what a great-looking group. So, look, this is amazing because, obviously, you know, Link2, you can get private equity to Ripple, Uphold, Link2 itself, BitPay, Dapper Labs, you name it. But Ripple's running another special, and they're continue or Link2's running another special for Ripple. It's being continued. You want to find out what that price is. You better go download the app. And if you're not accredited, download the app anyway, because there's so many data points of information of blockchain and fintech companies that you get for free, even if you're not accredited just yet. And if this market keeps going the way it's going, you will be soon. All right, let's talk about this right now. This is uh, Terra. It says it has halted blockchain for the second time in 24 hours. By the way, all the links underneath the video right here. A second time halt of Terra for 24 hours right now. But you know what? It may get better, ladies and gentlemen. And I know things are absolutely horrible. And I tell you, shame on anybody making fun of somebody who's lost money like this. You know, this is just horrible. It really is. But you do have to wonder, the big investors, the big VCs, when did they sell their Luna? Or did they even, right? Galaxy Digital, we see Mike Novogratz in here. We know early investor in Ethereum. We know he's always confused about what Ripple and XRP is, but he never seems to be confused about projects that are on Ethereum, though, right? So pretty interesting question right there. We will see if Mike actually answers and responds to everybody on crypto Twitter. However, there may be a bailout in the works for Terra. So look, this could be good, right? GAM said it is expected to invest two to three billion dollars to absorb the excess supply of U.S. Terra during its current sell-off. Check this out. It says here, the press release is a 40-year-old company reads that it has begun negotiations with Terraform Labs to help support its Luna stablecoin. GAM said it is expected to invest two to three billion to absorb the excess supply during its current sell-off, which should revive the U.S. Terra peg to the U.S. dollar. They say our interest in supporting U.S. terror reflects our interest in supporting a vibrant, innovative and resilient crypto market. We firmly believe in Terra's ecosystem. Just as importantly, we believe in U.S. Terra's algorithmic approach to valuation. When investors have proper incentives, they naturally trade in ways to maintain price stability. This was all from CEO Peter Sanderson. We will keep you up to date. I hope that that happens and they're able to get this thing back up off the ground. There's no question. People have been harmed to an incredible, alarming rate, and it is not funny ever. 
right here from Linda P. Jones said, did you notice that May 5th an Australian dollar backed stablecoin UADC is built on the Stellar blockchain was announced? And here it is right here through Novati Group Limited. We covered it here on this channel, but it is really worthy of note here. It's by launching a, a UAD backed stablecoin on Stellar. There it is. You have it right there. And shout out for the reminder here because you guys know how I feel. You know, it's XRP, XLM, these are two protocols and networks and tokens that I believe are going to be the uh, backbone of the new financial system. Now, it's not financial advice, and it's absolutely my speculation and my digital perspectives from years of research, but that's where I'm at on this day. Now, let's take a look at this because I tell you, you know, the SEC is certainly an agency that does not embarrass very easily here, ladies and gentlemen. And you're going to get more evidence of that today. The unmitigated gall. Uh, right here. And this is Stephen Hubert reminding us that this is from the SEC Enforcement Chief in his speech at the SEC Enforcement Forum yesterday. He actually complained about how defense attorneys are using delay tactics and refusing to release documents just to complicate and drag out investigations. <laughs> really? Wow. I wonder what his thoughts are on the SEC versus Ripple then. He must really be appalled by his own agency and the way they've done nothing but delay the case since they brought it against Ripple almost two years ago in December. Now let's get into this. This is very, very important, ladies and gentlemen. And I tell you, we have to watch all of this going forward because for one, you're going to see a central bank Ripple pilot news happening in Africa and it is massive. And also more news to go along with that, but also we're going to talk about what we've been following, certainly since going back to February of this year with Senator Elizabeth Warren. If you remember, I said that what Senator Elizabeth Warren was doing back when she grilled the, uh, uh, what was it here? Uh, let me get this right for us here. It was when she grilled uh, under Treasury Secretary uh, Nellie Liang, Right. Which, by the way, is right in here somewhere. That's her grilling her. We will get to that in a second. And I have only a couple clips for you to see of this. So just know that we are going to watch a couple clips of this and you're going to need to see it because what we're going to watch first in this is we are going to watch this clip from. Tom Emmer, and I have what he uh, did yesterday in a hearing here, and he basically accuses the current administration, U.S. administration, the Biden administration, of weaponizing FSOC to pursue the administration's agenda. And we're going to take a look at this. I have it right here, and you need to hear this where I have it clipped to where we're going to end. And then I'm going to give you the evidence that really supports everything that he is asking Janet Yellen here and some contradicting, contradicting video for you as well. Take a quick listen. Secretary Yellen, as the chair of the FSOC, you know better than anyone that the FSOC operates independently and is not directed by an administration to make and implement policy decisions. Mm. Historically, Madam Secretary, does the FSOC take direction from the White House on activities and institutions uh, which to investigate and if, if appropriate, designate those activities or institutions as systemic risks? The FSOC, as you said, is a group of independent it, My question is a yes or a no. Does the FSOC take direction from the White House? No, it does not. Thank you. That's what I thought. The mm. FSOC exists to independently identify emerging threats to our financial stability and align regulatory frameworks around those risks. Secretary Yellen, by executive order, you convened the President's Working Group on Financial Markets in July of 2021, and you played a key role in the delivery of its November 2021 stablecoin report. The report recommends that Congress enact legislation to limit stablecoin issuance to insured depository institutions, banks. For the record, this is a recommendation that does not have consensus in Congress, not even amongst committee Democrats. The report also states that in the absence of urgent congressional action to enact this legislative recommendation, the FSOC should step in to designate various stablecoin activities as systemic risks 
which would jumpstart administration-wide regulatory rulemaking. Listen. Secretary Yellen, has the FSOC officially designated digital asset or stablecoin activities as systemic risks? No, it is not done so. Thank you. And th no, it is not done so. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Take a listen. I think that simply illustrates that this is a rapidly growing uh, product and um, that there, there are risks to financial stability and we need- Oh, there's risks to financial stability, which does make it in fact a systemic risk, but we're not done, keep listening. We need a framework that's, that's appropriate. It, it just this is under Treasury Secretary uh, for the U.S. Treasury working directly underneath Janet Yellen being pinned to the wall by Elizabeth Warren for the purposes of the Biden administration's objective to absolutely weaponize FSOC so they don't have to do their job, which is exactly what I told you when I first covered this in February. We're over the target, ladies and gentlemen. Listen to this. Let me remind you what my question is. Oh, do please. Do they pose the threat of becoming a systemic risk? Of becoming a systemic risk, yes. Yes, they oh. do. Um, I agree. So they agree. It is a systemic risk, right? And yet she says here it isn't, but she said it is a risk to financial stability in the previous clip from just a day or so before this. You know, this is really questionable on Jan Yellen's part and certainly of the Department of Treasury, who are now in absolute contradicting, contradiction of one another. Continue to listen here. Thank you. Uh, digital asset and stable coin activities have not been officially designated as systemic risks from the FSOC. Do you believe the FSOC should take action if Congress does not urgently enact comprehensive crypto legislation? We would very much like to see Congress adopt a coherent I, I'll ask it again. I'm asking, I'm asking you, you would look who at. convenes the FSOC, it's, it's do you something. believe that the FSOC should take action if Congress does not urgently enact comprehensive crypto legislation? It's something that I think FSOC should look at. And so the answer is yes? I, I don't know that it's uh, appropriate, but it's so, something that bears, right. well, bears examination. Thank you. You previously explained to us that the FSOC operates independently and does not take direction from the White House on labeling systemic risks. However, it seems pretty clear that absent urgent action by Congress, the FSOC, under your leadership, is prepared, perhaps, even though you said maybe not appro appropriate in your words, is prepared to designate certain stablecoin activities as systemically risky in response to the White, House, uh, White House's digital asset agenda. It now, as everyone in this room is aware, Madam Secretary, legislating takes time. And there's nothing more dangerous to innovation and opportunity than when the federal government rushes to legislate or regulate, for that matter, the Biden administration knows this as well as any of us, but the president's working group and the President Biden's crypto executive order still threaten to ignite the FSOC if Congress doesn't do what Bi the Biden administration the requests. President's that is what we're talking about here, weaponizing FSOC. And you know what? Here's the woman doing it in the hearing back in February. It's Elizabeth Warren, Senator. Take a listen to this clip that I'm about to set up for you right now. And um, so how different tools would apply is a little bit difficult to prejudge how they would be used. Okay, okay. but, but you are willing to use them ahead of Congress. If that is the case and it is assessed that they are a systemic risk that needs to be addressed. Well, not that and they I are a systemic pre risk. Remember what it says on the website before that risk has reached fruition. Yeah, there it is right there, ladies and gentlemen. That's her telling her, no, before it becomes a risk and reaches fruition, right? Which is, again, I said this in February. I said it just a couple of days ago. This is Senator Warren saying, I'm upset that you won't do your job regardless of the fact that I'm not doing mine. She even says that later in this, in this remark right here. Listen. But that... De there's no reason to delay. Pointing a finger at Congress does not give you or FSOC the right to ignore your current statutory responsibilities. They, 
This is exactly what Tom Emmer is mad about, is the fact that he feels like because FSOC is supposed to be an independent group, an agency, the, why are they taking direction from the current administration and being pushed into doing this? You know, and then you have the contradictions between Nella Liang and Janet Yellen herself saying it is financial stability risk, which is a systemic risk, and Nellie Liang actually saying she agrees with Elizabeth Warren that it is a systemic risk. I tell you, the politics in this are disgusting because while all of this is happening, just look at the example of Luna and Terra and what has happened to the investors there while they posture and just try to figure out ways that they can not serve the people they are actually elected to protect and appointed to protect. All right, let's move on because we actually have some good news here, which is going to feel refreshing, right? And again, reminder, if you're accredited, you're not accredited, go join link to Ripple shares available right now. And it is at a very, very discounted price. Make sure you don't mess around and get on that right here and join if you're not accredited. So look, this is where we start with Leonidas right here. Shout out to him. This is James Wallace from Ripple. And listen what he's saying in this is the African workshop. And he talks about customers now moving towards using crypto for cross-border payments. Take a quick listen here. You know, I've been with Ripple for three years, and you know, we, we have something called RippleNet, which is a cross-border payments network. Um, we're also working on other initiatives. We have a central bank digital currency solution. But in terms of the, of the use of crypto, um, XRP, which is the, the crypto that we tend to use, uh, is used on a regular basis. And there's you know, billions of dollars being tra transacted the whole time using that as a, as a, what we call a bridge currency. So between one, one you know, fiat currency and another, um, the, the network enables connectivity fiat to fiat, but also increasingly, and I would say the majority of our customers now are moving towards um, using crypto for cross-border. It's cheaper, it's faster, there's no need to pre-fund accounts like you have in the you know, traditional correspondent banking model. Exactly. Now let's take a listen to this because this is where it gets really spicy. And he talks about the pilot that's happening. And I believe he says Nigeria with the central bank. Take a listen. Question. I think central bank digital money will definitely happen. I mean, it's already happening. Congratulations to Nigeria and, and a few other countries. Uh, we're working on projects that are a pilot prior to going live. So not proof of concepts. I think proof of concepts is should be a thing of the past now. Mm. And the big question really is question. Yeah, that's incredible. So Nigeria and a couple other countries and a proof of concept is a thing of the past now. We're piloting before going live. This is amazing is right from Rath the Conman right there. And then listen to this because they're also working on building a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform in the Republic of Palau where we already know they're working with the central bank there. Take a listen. Um, sort of retail uh, CBDCs. I don't think it's all, it's not just about payments either. Uh, one of the things, um, you know, we're working with a country called Palau, which is a very tiny country in the, in the Pacific Ocean. Um, they're a dollarized country. They don't have, um, therefore, a central bank, but they wanted to have their own currency to, for a whole series of different use cases. Um, so we're working with them to, to issue what I think will be the first government issued and regulated stablecoin, um, and they've got some really interesting use cases around that. Now, you could argue that you know you could do that within a different form, but digital money allows you to do things like this this P2P lending platform they're looking at. So, one of the cultural things in that country is you know when it's payday on a Friday, people take people line up around the corner to get money out of the cash out of the ATM, and then they they have a culture of um, lending money to friends and family for all sorts of different reasons. So they go and they drive to the next sort of town and they lend some cash. And so one of the things we're, that they want us to build with them is a, a P2P lending platform, right? So it's a very simple DeFi, distributed finance application that leverages a digital currency. So in that case, it will be a stable coin. But, um, so I think the, 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 the so you, you can definitely pay for your coffee here, right? And, or anywhere around the world, but I think I'd like to think about this as 
a platform for new innovation as opposed to necessarily fixing the past. So. And that's what we're talking about here. It is very exciting. Look, Central Bank in Africa, pilot test soon to launch other countries as well. Now you have a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform. Don't forget that it's going to be the first government-backed stable coin. And we've just come off of all of this collapse and run on uh, Terra Luna. You know, this is exciting to me. And the market is now, or XRP, certainly up 14.4% this morning. And the market itself up 8.5%. Hopefully, we've hit our bottom. I don't know. But I tell you, this is where we are on this day. And one quick reminder. Remember, through all of the down movement price and the crash of the market and all of these things, for the customers that you use on-demand liquidity and the asset XRP to move money and value, the transaction never changed. It costs the same. That's extremely important to understand because for the customers that are going to use this for moving value and money and payments of the world, they didn't see the transaction costs go up. The cost stayed the same. And that's how you really prove to the world that this token, this bridge asset is viable for payments and moving value. The only thing left to do is to continue to bring the utility and the liquidity to the network. That's going to do it for me. Make sure you hit the like and subscribe. Leave a comment below. I'll catch all of you on the next one.